Hello, I am Zahir Alam. Welcome you all on Frankly Speaking. Our today's guest is Baroness Manzila Paulaudin. She is the first member of Bangladesh origin in the House of Lords, Upper House of British Parliament, and the chairman of the All Party Parliamentary Groups on Bangladesh. A strident advocate for social justice, human rights, and equality over the last two decades, Baroness Uddin of Bethnal Green in London was elevated to the peerage by Prime Minister Tony Blair in 1998. She became the first Muslim woman to enter the House of Lords. Welcome, Baroness Uddin, on oh, Frankly Speaking. Thank speak. you, Islam. Uh, you were born in Bangladesh, but you grew up in London. So would you tell us about your childhood and um, uh, how uh, your family had been migrated to the United Kingdom? Hmm. I, I was born in Rajshahi, and um, I went just after the war to join my father with my mother and my brothers and sisters. And uh, I, I, when I was 13, just a few months after the war uh, with Pakistan, and I have lived in London ever since. And over the last 30 years, my home has been Silet, and uh, that's where I live now, uh, whenever I come to Bangladesh. And uh, it was a very remarkable childhood, of course, facing uh, the Civil War. And then, of course, uh, the struggle to find a place for us all um, in Britain. Uh, and uh, m like many other immigrants and migrants, I joined the same struggle. And uh, it has been a long and uh, happy and uh, uh, difficult life. Difficult life. <laughs> for, so a long time you have been uh, living in the United Kingdom. But um, you have visited also Bangladesh many times. So what is the purpose uh, of uh, your visit this time? Mm. Yes, I mean, I, you know, Bangladesh has remained very close to my and my family's, my husband and my children's heart, and uh, we visit very often. Uh, and, and this particular visit is about, uh, in some sense, I don't, you know, of course, you know the turmoil of Bangladesh. Uh, over the last few months, it created enormous amount of concerns yeah. in um, uh, Britain, particularly amongst Probashi Bangladeshi. Uh, and uh, it was right that uh, numerous questions have been raised, and I took part in several discussions in the uh. media, in Parliament about Bangladesh, and everyone had become very concerned about the welfare of Bangladesh and what was going to happen, what was going to happen post all this violence. And in fact, when the election was declared, and of course, you know, I, I was very privileged. I was going to come as part of the EUC observers. And it didn't happen because there was just so many changes of so dates. Many. And so I didn't take part. And uh, as a member of All Party Group on Bangladesh, myself and Lord Ahmed came here a few days ago, deciding to come here and find out what's going on, speak to the various officials, speaking to various members uh, and leaders of the parties. And, and I'm, I've been learning about it the last four days, I spent some time in Silet as well. And I'm going to go back and report it uh, to my members. Um, uh, you have uh, already met uh, with uh, some of the government and political leaders in Bangladesh, mm -hmm. and uh, definitely you discussed uh, issues related to election and good governance. And so uh, what impressions uh, uh, you have got uh, from the uh, mm -hmm. Bangladeshi leaders? The message from British Bangladeshis was absolutely unequivocal in that they are supporting the current process of the caretaker government. And uh, they're pleased, I think, with uh, some of the reports and feedbacks that they have from their relatives in Bangladesh. And those who visited recently have been pleased about the way that Bangladesh is now a little bit calmer. And uh, hopefully things are get, you know, going to be put in place. Obviously, there are lots of challenges, and uh, those challenges are still supported by people of Bangladesh, I understand. That's my impression. And also um, elsewhere, Bangladeshi communities in Britain, America, and elsewhere are, are at the moment and, and have given quite carte blanche support to the caretaker government, have quite a lot of confidence that the peaceful, you know, sort of calm that has uh, arrived in Bangladesh may yield a good, a safe, free and fair political environment for a free and fair election to take place. I think that's the impression. And really, as a, a, a member of British Parliament, I have to make it clear that, you know, and I've said it again and again, it is not our business, really, what happens in some sense about the, you know, due process, if you like, about the practicalities. For us, you know, um, all party members, um, the only wish is the welfare of people of Bangladesh and welfare of Bangladesh but itself. But what, what messages you have got from Bangladesh side? 
Yeah, I think that, you know, um, it, the impression that we were given just after uh, the caretaker government took, this caretaker government uh, took hold uh, under Dr. Fakhruddin Ahmed, that, you know, the, they're doing everything that they can in their power to make sure that uh, the transition is taking place as smooth as possible, yet it's going to take a little time. So there are lots and lots of issues, but, you know, we... Really, it is not for us to embark on a discussion about the nitty-gritty details. Yet. It's purely about, you know, how is it? What can we do? We want to support, and that kind of it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a friendly gesture, and it's one also which will I will go back and Lord Ahmed will go back and we will talk about it, uh, and we will talk about it uh, in the way that we found it. And I think it is a a good move, and I think it's a very positive advancement, and we hope that uh, in due process will take place. In, in as quickly as possible, um, you know, and as quickly as it is possible to have uh, an election, I'm sure it will happen. Okay, you tell me that uh, is it uh, evident or explicitly demonstrated for Bangladesh side that the uh, government, Ketik administrations, heading towards uh, holding a free or fair election? I think that is up to the people of Bangladesh to judge, and I think you have a very vibrant. Um, uh, you know, media industry, and I think that that is that is being reporting back. And as my impression is definitely that they're on the right path. They're working through some of the difficult issues. They're ironing out. They, you know, very much uh, met the demands of people of Bangladesh. People of Bangladesh were seeking peace. People of Bangladesh were seeking uh, due process to take place in terms of the election, so all parties can take part. And so the the you know whatever the emergence of the this calm period is, must be one that will be conducive and healthy for Bangladesh. They are working on some other issues uh, related to good governance and mm. uh, eliminating corruption in the society. I think that can only be a very positive thing. As you know, you know, those of us who were born in Bangladesh, like myself, who live in Britain, we haven't been very proud of some of the way that Bangladesh has been portrayed over the last four or five months. Okay. And as someone who's in politics... Is it all about four or five months or yeah. the decades long? Yes. No, I'm talking about particularly a very shameful... Politics, yeah. uh, conf not just, you know, sh uh, confrontational, but shameful period of history in Bangladesh, very right. violent, uh, yeah. where innocent people have lost their life. And it's not in anyone's interest. But the point being that I think it is important to say that... Uh, um, I think that the uh, steps that are being suggested, certainly, I mean, I had a long conversation with the, <clears throat> uh, both the foreign affairs advisor as well as the chief caretaker. Uh, and I think that, you know, all the indications suggest that they have a hand, you know, they have a good grip yeah. in terms of making sure that the processes are in place and that they are going to talk to everyone and they are going to make sure that it is free and fair and it's sustainable. Sustainable Because what is yeah. absolutely imperative is that if the, all the work is done and then uh, the election is called and everyone returns to a period of violence, that will not be acceptable, I understand, from what I'm hearing for people of Bangladesh. So I'm sure between the people, citizens of Bangladesh and the caretaker government, I'm sure you will arrive at a point of no return, but, you know, uh, happy coexistence, if you and like. And I, as far as we are concerned from, you know, uh, Britain, we just want to see Bangladesh peaceful and stable because it is remarkable, isn't it, that Bangladesh, despite this very turmoil, you know, time, uh, it's done remarkably well economically. Economic France. And so you can imagine the potential of Bangladesh and the development of Bangladesh that can be achieved. So surely that must be everyone's goals, those who are not uh, in Bangladesh and those who are, you know, and I think if we can just kind of work together and support each other, I think that uh, the future future of Bangladesh is very rosy because as I was sitting on my sitting room uh, in, in Silet, uh, in, in our house, I heard that new gas has been discovered uh, ah, yeah. in, or oil has been discovered in Silet. So you just imagine the potential of development in many parts of uh, Bangladesh is remarkable. So, but for, in order to, for be people to benefit from that, there has to be peaceful, stable government all across, not just central government, but local government, you know, um, law and order and all of that has to be in place. And I think that all the indication to me for a very brief visit, okay, it's a very brief visit, so I don't want to make a big assumptions, but from all the indication, it appears that 
the right steps are being taken and we come to say that we support it uh, and we came to say that if there's anything we can do we are prepared to do so uh, but we shall keep our talks continue Our guest is Baroness Uddin, the first Muslim woman in House of Lords, a rare distinction for a Bangladeshi origin. Uh, Baroness Uddin, uh, the development partners, uh, including Britain, emphasizing on uh, sustainable democracy in Bangladesh. You have had uh, discussions and conversation with the major political party leaders in Bangladesh uh, when you're visiting. Um, so uh, how uh, did they think about the reform and uh, uh, looking at the sustainable democracy in Bangladesh? When I say sustainable, it's not about development. Sustainability simply means at a period of time when you know there's going to be a prolonged peace and just simply people willing to talk to each other, to take part in your democratic process. So I, I think that's what I mean. That, I mean, I want to make that clear. Yes, we spoke to uh, numerous um, uh, leaders, uh, both the major political leaders, Sheikh Hasina and uh, Khalid Azia. They are willing to take part. They're willing to talk. They're willing to dialogue. And they're waiting, as far as I understand. Now, it is totally up to the people of Bangladesh and of course for now it's totally up to the caretaker government itself to determine how they are involved, involved and, and it is really absolutely no business of ours to make any other comments about that other than simply to say it was really imperative that we came and we came to learn because you know Britain and Bangladesh is such a long established relationship the British Bangladesh has played such a remarkable role in supporting Bangladesh to the independence, although I was here during the war myself. And so I, I know that if, you know, very large sections of, you know, Probashi um, Jara, uh, if they withdrew the support from Bangladesh, Bangladesh would suffer deep financial crisis because we are a contributor. But we're not just contributors, you know, we are well wishers. We love Bangladesh. And we came with all the good wishes. And I, I promise you, you know, we are taking back some of the remarkable stories, some of the remarkable progress that's happening. Because while I've been here, not only did we meet the leaders, well, but What I is the state of women folk in Bangladesh in your eye? Well, from an outside observer, yep. um, the you know the, this has got the largest women-led women NGOs. It has two remarkable women who are its political leaders and has been for a long time. So from outside, it is a great story, you know. And I've always been proud. If anyone in England ever asked me about my you know feminist um, historians or uh, my heroes, I always refer back to Bangladesh. I I know that my confidence in my political life, my confidence in my family life comes from the fact that I was born in Bangladesh and brought up in England. You know, the two combination is yeah, great. Yeah. And I think that the two combination can still be great in order to support each other. So what actions uh, in your mind to take up for Bangladesh uh, development of women folk in Bangladesh? So I'd quite like to see some work done there. And over the last two years or so, I've been working about in about you know in around our, the my sort of husband's in Silat region. Yes, absolutely, <laughs> a home and our home now where where we are, which is in uh, Jawar Bazar, Kidra Kapoor. And uh, we've been working in about in eight, which district? Uh, uh, Shunamgon. Shunamgon. Yeah, although we still like to say Chatok and you know Silat is no different. Have you visited the how areas? Always. My house, our house is right in the middle of it. So, yes, absolutely. I can overlook it. And we spent last two days, uh, you know, seeing some of the men and women, children doing sports. We'd organize some sports. And it's been a very, very remarkable time. And in terms of women's development, I think it's critical that, you know, we concentrate away from the area which is easily accessible, like Dhaka and Rashrai and Dinajpur and Chattogram, yeah. but go into the villages of Silet. Because empowerment for women has to come from rural area, because unless and until you have that, uh, total empowerment is not possible. And one thing that, you know, there is a lot of prejudice about 
Bangladeshis being, you know, particularly women being oppressed, and yeah. you know, we have domestic violence, forced marriage, and so child la child labor. Yeah. Of course, there is in yeah. all society there is, but. I, I was really impressed by, you know, the sort of the schools around villages where nearly more than 100, more than the boys, the girls took place freely in sports, in singing, in, uh, in recitation and all sorts of things. And they spent two days, you know, under God made, you know, uh, earth, you know, sort of the beautiful surrounding of, you know, village skies playing and performing. So these kind of stories you don't often get to, you know, sort of uh, tell in places like Britain. And that's one of the things I'm going to do after we go back. We will report not only about the political changes and the political uh, uh, situations and what's happening, which is, I think, you know, is in good, steady progress, making good, steady progress. Do, do, do you think that the level or the degree of violence against the women folk in Bangladesh is still significant and um, uh, are you concerned about it? I think uh, violence against women is a real serious issue. And across the globe. Across the globe, across the earth. Across that's what, earth. and I, so I, I think that it's really important when we are targeting, when we are tackling women's education, women's empowerment in terms of economic uh, participation. I think that's when the changes come in tackling violence against women. That's just, you know, worldwide. That's, there's no different solutions required. There's uh, this uh, nonsensical idea that somehow, because one is, a, you know, one is a Muslim country and one isn't, there's somehow the degree of violence is more prevalent in one society than other. I mean, as a, you know, real feminist and a champion advocate for women, I can tell you, I would dismiss that theory out of hand. Baron Sodin, once you said that uh, you wanted to do something practical with deep sense of frustration at seeing Islam and Muslim taking the burden of terror and brutality. You felt that this is not the Islam you love and you know. But what is the real picture uh, of Islam and Muslim community in, in your country now, mm. United Kingdom? I think that I made those general points, and very clever of you to get hold of them, but I made those general points specifically about the global context, I think. I think there's a global uh, depiction of Islam is synonymous with uh, brown faces and salwa kameez and sharis, you know. And I think it's deeply unfair because it doesn't depict the different pictures in different parts of the world, including Bangladesh and Pakistan, India and elsewhere. And I think that this kind of globalization of, you know, terror is wrong, simply. But I would say to you that uh, I am deeply proud and honored to be a British citizen. Nowhere else on earth you know, a Bangladeshi Muslim woman can become a member of the House of Lords. It's not possible. You can imagine that in America, you know, there is, people think it's unimaginable to elect a woman, uh, you know, president. You can imagine these discussions go on. And it's only recently that America has um, uh, adopted uh, or elected uh, a black candidate who sees potential for becoming the next president, although I think it's going to be Hillary Clinton. But anyway, that's another yes, discussion. Yeah. But I, I have to tell you that British Muslims have a very uh, a prominent place in society. We uh, enjoy the protection of law uh, and liberty as an equal citizen. But remarkable questions against discrimination of the Muslim uh, yes. community or Muslim, yes. in the job market especially. I think that it, it, I think we would in Britain stand out against any other countries in the world. I can write you down this now because I've traveled very widely and have seen the conditions of particularly Bangladeshi and Pakistani community elsewhere were in the Middle East and in America, all the Americans, uh, you know, countrymen and women are much more wealthier than perhaps in Britain. But I think we have contributed, British Muslims have contributed to the economy very much so over decades and decades, generations and generations. And of course, there's been some terrible incidents, Seven namely 7-7. Seven. Seven, seven. And we've got to stand up and say that those people are not part of our society. We condemn them outright. But I think it's really important when you rationally question the standing of Bangladeshis, Pakistani migrant community in Britain, it is outstanding and it is second to none because nowhere else do we enjoy more ability to 
just live as ordinary citizens. So I'm really, really proud. And of course, we can have a thousand discussions about some of the discriminations. And that's why people like myself have come into politics, come into the community, because we say that no citizen should be discriminated against, just like women's organizations say they shouldn't be discriminated against. Okay, Baron, so then um, uh, very briefly, very briefly, we are at the fag end of our program. So how did you become a uh, baroness? Through a lot of hard work and a lot of luck, but actually I came into politics very much wanting to change things uh, for the better. And I have to tell you, without my husband and my children and their resilience and their support, I would be nowhere in politics. Thank you very much, Thank Baron Sodin, for you, joining us on Frankly Speaking. Great pleasure. Thank you very much. Islamiko. Dear viewers, Baron Sodin, member of the House of Lords, expressed her optimism on holding a free and fair election and improvement of governance through the steps being taken. She said as close development partner of Bangladesh, Britain will extend all of its support to the Bangladeshi people in obtaining its desired goal. That's it for today. See you on the next episode. Until then, bye-bye.